Well, good morning, everyone. I am delighted to see that there's people uh, interested in post-Keynesian economics on a Sunday at 9.30. <laughs> um, and I will try to uh, not put you back to sleep, which is where we probably want to be at this time. But we want to uh, mobilize all our enthusiasm to discuss post-Keynesian economics. So what is it that I shall be doing? I shall walk you through the basics of post-Keynesian economics. So I'm going to start uh, with the concept of fundamental uncertainty. I will discuss uh, the notion of social conflict, uh, distributional conflict that will play a critical role in the theory of inflation. And I will introduce you uh, to the principle of effective demand. After that, there shall be a block where I walk you uh, through the structure of the post-Keynesian macroeconomic uh, theory model. That will highlight that in the post-Keynesian models the causality goes from investment to savings. Uh, it will feature involuntary unemployment as a uh, regular property of capitalist economies. Um, uh, then I'll say a few more words on uh, post-Keynesian monetary analysis uh, that in particular covers the field of uh, endogenous money creation that the causality in the post-Keynesian uh, models goes from credit to money, not the other way around, or from credit to deposits. Uh, and it features the possibility of financial instability either in the incarnation of the liquidity crisis uh, that we have in Keynes or uh, in the debt side case uh, that I associated with Hyman Minsky. Uh, thereafter, depending on uh, how short I am in terms of time, I'll say a few words more about the history of post Keynes in economics, both in the sense of discussing uh, the development of post Keynes in economics, and there have been uh, thematic shifts in post-Keynesian economics, in particular the early debates were much more uh, on growth theory and on the theory of income distribution. Recently there's a lot more discussion of uh, monetary financial issues and also of economic policy. Uh, and I'll also try to locate uh, post-Keynesian economics within other uh, Keynesians or nominally Keynesian streams, so that's the old uh, neoclassical Keynesian synthesis and uh, the more recent New Keynesians. And uh, by then I'll probably have run out of time. If not, I'll also say a few more words on economic policy. Uh, when talking about post Keynesian economics, I like to use this triangle consisting of fundamental uncertainty, social conflict, and effective demand. Uh, Post-Keynesian economics, in the meantime, is a fairly coherent body of theory. We have several uh, textbooks uh, that um, uh, summarize the overall outlook. Uh, and uh, there's a whole infrastructure of conferences uh, and journals uh, that organizes post-Keynesian economics. Uh, and while there's uh, some differences in emphasis, I think that most post-Keynesians would uh, agree with the, the overview that I'm giving. Uh, at the basis of my triangle, I have fundamental uncertainty and social conflict to highlight that there's some post-Keynesians or some origins of post-Keynesian economics are uh, around the notion of fundamental uncertainty, uh, a whole distinct uh, set of theories about the role of money and liquidity that follows from that uh, uh, certain uh, characteristics of investment expenditures follow from that. Uh, but there's a second uh, uh, stream uh, or origin of post Keynesian economics and that's around the issue uh, of social conflict, class conflict, distributional conflict, uh, often associated in post-Keynesian economics uh, with Michael Kalecki, but also in the, uh, uh, in the early Cambridge uh, controversies, two class models uh, uh, standard. Now, what unifies post-Keynesian economics is that they look at 
uh, the uh, role of either fundamental uncertainty uh, or social conflict, uh, the effect that it has on effective demand. And all post-Keynesian uh, models or theories are one where uh, demand does not automatically uh, uh, equal supply in the sense of says law, that supply would create its own demand, but all post-Keynesian models, or indeed all proper Keynesian models, uh, have uh, an independent uh, determination of demand, and thus the investment savings equilibrium will be central. So what do post-Keynesians mean by fundamental uncertainty? And uh, at this conference, we've had uh, uncertainty in various guises, often under the name of radical or Knightian uncertainty. Uh, fundamental uncertainty for post-Keynesians means uh, it's a situation where, in the last instance, we simply don't know, as Keynes has put it. Now, that we simply don't know is not meant as a statement about the cognitive ability of humans. It's a statement about the nature of world. It's not about bounded rationality. It's something about the inherent unpredictability of the world. In the sense that uh, history, the history of societies and thus the history uh, of uh, economies is an open-ended process. It's not like a mechanical clockwork uh, that you could uh, if only you knew the right equations, uh, you could calculate for the next few centuries ahead. It's simply not sufficiently determined. Uh, the, in that sense, it's a statement about the nature of the world, not about the abilities uh, of humans to forecast. Uh, the question is what follows from that? Uh, and there's a, uh, in mainstream economics, uh, sort of a reflex to say, well, if that is the case, if we can't predict the world, then there's basically nothing we can say about human behavior. That is not uh, the conclusion that post-Keynesians draw from it. Rather, our conclusion is that uh, in order to survive in such a world of fundamental uncertainty, people have to adopt certain uh, conventions. Uh, these conventions are essentially certain norms. They are simple rules that people uh, follow in order to structure their behavior, but also in order to justify their behavior. Uh, therefore, there's a certain affinity of uh, some post-Keynesian arguments to what we often have in uh, behavioral economics in the sense that there will exist a simple heuristic that uh, uh, will guide human behavior, but these heuristics are social conventions and thus they are to some extent arbitrary. They will have their own uh, uh, history. Uh, they may have institutions that back them up by force, uh, say a legal system, um, or it may be uh, uh, the, the, the board of a company uh, in front of which management may have to justify its behavior. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, uh, social norms are not just something that uh, spontaneously emerges between uh, uh, individuals, but it is something that is rooted in the institutions and the social infrastructure uh, of a society. Uh, Keynes, in the general theory, uh, enumerates a number of them, uh, in particular uh, the argument that uh, for, and he uh, has mostly the, the working of, uh, of financial markets in mind here. Uh, he's arguing that humans most of the time assume that the past, uh, uh, the future will be similar to the past unless there's quite specific reasons to assume otherwise. Um, th these notions uh, will also give rise to hurt behavior. They are sort of self-fulfilling prophecies if enough people uh, adopt a certain uh, a social norm that means that it will affect economic outcomes. Thus, we have uh, regularities in the economy that we can observe, also test econometrically. Uh, but from the post-Keynesian view, these regularities, uh, and consequently, if you're doing econometrics, the econometric <coughs> results that you get don't necessarily reflect deep structural causes uh, or deep underlying parameters, say, of a production function or anything of that sort, but rather they reflect uh, historically contingent social norms and institutions. 
that for a while may give rise uh, to stable behavioral pattern that you then observe in the data. Um, the first, uh, or the second uh, economically important implication of this notion of uncertainty is a quite distinct theory uh, of money or money demand uh, in post-Keynesian economics. Uh, that's the Keynesian notion of liquidity preference. In the post-Keynesian world, people hold money in a way as an insurance against uncertainty. If you don't, in the last instance, know what the future will bring, one way to insure yourself against these uncertain outcomes is that you maintain flexibility. And the flexi maintaining the flexibility on financial markets is holding liquid assets. They will usually come with very little return, but it means that in the next period you still know uh, uh, the value or the purchasing power uh, of, of uh, uh, your portfolio. Whereas is with any other financial investment strategies, you will have higher returns, uh, but in the last instance you run the risk that the uh, uh, asset value uh, collapses and therefore uh, uh, the, you may occur losses. The implication of that is that um, the demand for liquidity will be a, a, in a way the flip side of what's going on in all sorts of asset markets. And if uh, you have a stock market crash, if there's uh, a panic on uh, the stock market or in other financial uh, uh, markets and people are selling off these assets, in return they will start holding cash. Therefore, uh, the asset, uh, uh, the, the demand for liquidity or the liquidity preference will be directly related to uh, uh, the state of confidence on financial markets. Now if you think about it, that is a very different theory uh, of what money does in, a, in an economy. Now, in a standard mainstream model, people are holding money because they want to engage in real transactions. They want to buy something. You're holding money in order to spend it, in order to buy something. In the post-Keynesian theory of money, you're holding money precisely because you don't know what to buy, because you don't want to buy something. Yeah? So the, the, the function that money plays is a very different one. And therefore, from a post-Keynesian point of view, you might expect a fairly stable money demand that's related to real expenditures for most of the time. But in a financial crisis, you will have a very different demand for liquidity because then the uncertainty kicks in. Uh, so the first uh, the big effect of uh, 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 implication of uncertainty was about human behavior and rationality in general. Second one was about its um, uh, implication for the theory of money. The third big block is for investment expenditures. Now when Keynes talks about fundamental uncertainty, he doesn't have in mind uh, short-term decisions. He doesn't have in mind the situation where you do go to the restaurant, look at the menu and think about should you be ordering pizza or pasta if I think of yesternight. Uh, Keynes would be fairly confident that you will have a good idea about whether you'll prefer pizza or pasta or what sauce with your pasta. So that's not what we mean by uncertainty that uh, we, we don't uh, it, it's not an uncertainty associated with most consumption decisions. Where uncertainty comes in, uh, importantly for macroeconomics, is in decisions with long time horizons. Uh, and that is where investment expenditure comes in. So Keynes uh, says that uh, when you think about an investment decision, rationally what you would have to do, you would have to calculate the net present value of the expected future income flows. Now, if you're doing uh, a serious investment project uh, with a lifespan of, say, 20 or 30 years, that means that you would have uh, to have a pretty good idea of various scenarios associated with the prob probability distributions of what the cash flows of that investment project over the course of the next, say, 30 years will be. Now, Keynes himself was writing uh, the general theory, or it was published in, in 36, thus before the Second World War. Uh, 
And the example that he picks is the demand for copper, but you can take any other metal that might be affected uh, by, say, armament production. So if you did any rational forecast of the demand for copper for the next 30 years, in 36, you would have to have a pretty solid idea of the probability distributions of A, the Second World War breaking out. In 36, you don't know that there is a Second World War. For us, it's clear. But in 36, it's not. It's a distinct possibility, but it's not clear. You would have to have an idea of when, say, Japan would enter that World War, or if it does or if it doesn't. At that time, it's also not clear whether the US would join the World War. In the First World War, it was very eager not to join. So, and then you would have to have an idea of what happens after, how long it will last, what happens after the Second World War. Remember, after the Second World War, immediately was a quite bumpy time, the first few years, and then you have what we now know as the Golden Age. You would have to have an idea of all that and its probability distribution. Now, this is the sense in which Keynes says, in the last instance, our capitalists, whatever they do, they are not basing their investment decision on any sort of rational calculations because they simply don't have the relevant data. They may depend it on their self-confidence, uh, they may uh, uh, base it on the behavior of what other things do, they may base it on what the Financial Times is writing, but it's not optimizing behavior in any fundamental sense. Therefore, <coughs> investment decisions for post-Keynesians always have a very strong non-rational uh, element in it that in the last instance is exogenous uh, to economic variables, so at least can be exogenous. And therefore, whether it's the short run or the long run, post-Keynesians will always have an independent investment function. Now, there's other things that you can do with uncertainty in particular. Some post-Keynesians are turning it into uh, a whole economic methodology of an open systems approach, but I shall not be going into that now. The second uh, pillar of post-Keynesian economics that I want to talk about is social conflict. And that indeed is a bit more uh, Kaletsky, Robinson, Sraffer, uh, and so on than uh, Keynes himself. In Keynes, you don't have a whole lot of social class and uh, distributional conflict uh, sort of pops up occasionally, but it's, it's not very prominent. But in post-Keynesian economics, uh, it is important. Uh, now, distributional conflict uh, in most post-Keynesian models or theories is essentially class conflict, but in principle you can extend that uh, and, uh, and think of it of conflict between other social groups as well. And many post-Keynesian models will have essentially three classes, worker, uh, capitalists or capital, and rentier. So there's typically uh, a, a separate class, a, a, a separate sector in the economy uh, for uh, the financial sector. Uh, and these classes uh, have quite different roles and functions within the economy. Uh, capital hires labor. Uh, that is a non-trivial statement if you think of uh, debt hiring as an asymmetric process, and in particular if you think of debt as an economy uh, where you have a firing threat. Now, post-Keynesian models are one where involuntary unemployment is the norm. Therefore, there is a firing threat in these uh, models. Now, uh, just to, to contrast it to a proper Valrasian uh, model, if you have a clearing labor market, uh, there's no asymmetry of power between capital and labor, and no worker would be worried about being fired because the economy is in equilibrium and at the given wage rate uh, our worker is, well, he's first of all indifferent between working and non-working at the margin anyways, but he is perfectly comfortable that he will find another job because <coughs> it's by design, it's a market clearing model. Therefore, uh, uh, there's no firing threat in a simple uh, neoclassical model. Uh, that is why Paul Samuelson uh, at the time when mainstream economists were still talking to post Keynesians said, well, it doesn't really matter if you think of it of capital hiring labor or labor hiring capital. It's really the same thing. Now, in post-Keynesian models, it's not. Uh, 
there's involuntary unemployment, and it's clear that the stock of capital is owned by capitalists. And it's capitalists that make the investment decisions. And those investment decisions are what are driving the post-Keynesian models. Therefore, uh, in post-Keynesian models, there's a big asymmetry and it's capitalists uh, making the key decisions. Um, now, capitalists are, of course, not always free in making uh, decisions. Uh, they will, what they're doing uh, may or may not be constrained uh, by all sorts of things on the financial markets, in particular by the amount uh, of profits that are being, that is being distributed to shareholders or paid out as interest payments. Um, so class struggle uh, or social conflict does play an important role in post-Keynesian uh, economics, so distribution between classes plays an important role. However, it's a somewhat different sort of conflict uh, than the one we know from Marxian models. In the Marxist models, it's very much a class conflict uh, on the one hand about income distribution, but importantly on the site of production. Now, post-Keynesian models usually don't have a whole lot to say about the production process, which I actually regard as a sort of shortcoming, but rather they stress that the supply side is usually not the binding constraint uh, of the economy. Uh, but the income distribution does play an important role uh, in, um, uh, in the post-Keynesian world, and that's essentially because those different classes will have very different savings and consumption propensities, and again, it's only one of the class that will make uh, the investment decisions. Um, now, once you have a view of society as one that is characterized by class conflict, you get a very different understanding of the role of institutions from mainstream economics. In mainstream economics, institutions are essentially uh, in uh, a mechanism of allocation. It, it sets, or to be more precise, it typically distorts prices because it's a, it's a market clearing world and thus the, the, the key information is always the prices and what the institutions does do is they influence prices. Uh, usually they do so very inefficiently because they're distorting the market. Now in the post-Keynesian world and in potentially uh, in the Marxist world, but also in say, a lot of the arguments coming out of economic sociology, once you have social conflict, uh, then what institutions do is they mediate, regulate, stabilize, channel social conflict. They're a reaction to a society that uh, potentially could erupt in, uh, in conflict. And what institutions do is they, they shape that. And that mediation of conflict, while potentially repressive, is in principle a, a, a very productive and creative process and not a market distortion. Uh, specifically, uh, I've, I've already mentioned in, in macroeconomic models, income distribution will be important because of different uh, savings and consumption propensity, but uh, social conflict will also be important in the theory of inflation. Inflation in post-Keynesian models, and they are called conflicting claims models, is the outcome uh, to a large extent of unresolved distribution of conflict. Now mind you, uh, in a, we will in post-Keynesian economics have a, a theory of uh, endogenous money creation, thus inflation can never be a result uh, of changes in the money supply because the money supply is endogenous. Therefore, you need a different theory of inflation uh, and conflict inflation is one of these. Just as a footnote, most of post-Keynesian uh, uh, stories about uncertainty are very much about the uncertainty <coughs> of capitalists uh, and of course, sometimes more general about the methodological implications but of course, one could also push the concept of uncertainty and think about, well, what does it mean for workers? Is there a class dimension to uncertainty? And what comes to mind, though you find very little uh, published on it, of course, the expression for workers is job insecurity. That's the main form of uncertainty that, that workers face. It's not about what will be the return on my investment project in us. 
in the next uh, 20, 30 years because most workers don't have those investment projects, leaving aside pension funds, depending on your pension system. But for them, the fundamental form of uncertainty is will I have a job tomorrow? Now, the unifying feature uh, for post Keynesian economics uh, is certainly the principle of effective demand. And that is that if you want to understand the macroeconomy, if you want to understand income determination, it's about an investment savings equilibrium. Uh, and that equilibrium uh, is essentially driven or is created by adjustment of income. It's not the interest rate as in the loanable funds theory, it's income that adjusts uh, uh, the in, uh, that, that brings about the investment savings equilibrium. And the way it does that is via the multiplier process. Therefore, for post Keynesians, the causality quite unambiguously goes uh, from investment to savings. It's investment that creates the income via the multiplier process such that uh, savings will equal investment by the end of the day. And you can maintain that even if uh, you have an accelerator term and investment to some extent depends on the income level itself. Investment in these models is never constrained uh, by savings because investment creates the income out of which uh, people will save, but it can be constrained by finance. It can be constrained by the availability of credit, essentially by the lending decisions of banks because the individual firm, of course, uh, will uh, be finance constrained. Um, so empirically in a way the claim of post Keynesians of Keynesians more general, the, the old Keynesians of the 50s and 60s did agree with that uh, by and large is that investment expenditures will be the single most important determinant uh, of fluctuations in income. Now by that we don't mean the only one but we mean that most business cycles will be driven uh, by investment expenditures. And what you see here uh, is the macroeconomic data uh, for uh, uh, the last 10 years, which covers uh, the crisis 2008-2009 for the UK. And you do see the red line uh, is uh, investment expenditures, and that is the one that has the strongest uh, fluctuations over the business cycle, and if you look at other business cycles, you are seeing a very similar pictures. Uh, consumption uh, typically is, uh, is smooth compared to GDP, so it's not driving uh, uh, the business cycle. Uh, and as our uh, macroeconomic equilibrium is a goods market equilibrium, and we haven't brought in the labor market yet, uh, in general, there's no reason to assume that our goods market equilibrium or investment savings equilibrium will be one of full employment. So in the Keynesian view, in a way, there's a hierarchy of markets. So these markets, these three blocks of markets, goods market, financial market, labor market, uh, uh, sort of have function by very different rules. They are very different uh, markets. The labor market is one uh, that is not self-adjusting. Uh, it's not one in which the economy is anchored. I mean, if you think of the basic neoclassical models, you start out with the optimizing behavior of households and firms, derive labor supply and labor demand, uh, and then with a the production function, you essentially get the, the equilibrium output or the vertical AS curve. That's essentially everything important of the economy in terms of output is already set at this stage. For the post Keynesian, in the post Keynesian view, the labor market gets dragged along with the goods market, and there will be some feedback of the labor market, uh, but that uh, feedback is very much a nominal feedback. If you have uh, high levels of involuntary unemployment, what you will get is you will get uh, declines in nominal wages depending on, on, on how uh, sticky or rigid wages are. Keynes uh, did think that wages uh, would be uh, uh, somewhat inflexible downwards, but he, he did not claim, contrary to much of the uh, uh, mainstream Keynesians afterwards, he did not claim that 
uh, wage rigidity was the cause of unemployment. He believed that it was a stylized fix, that there would be a lot more resistance to downward wage adjustment and therefore effectively wages to some extent would be sticky, but he did not regard that uh, as the cause of unemployment. So what Keynes points out with respect to the labor market is that, and that's chapter 19 of the general theory, is that um, if you have a wage cut, uh, if you want to generate a, a, the regular downward sloping labor demand curve in the real wage, you would first of all have to demonstrate that a nominal wage cut will result in a higher level of aggregate demand. Uh, and Keynes then goes on and says, well, if you work through the mechanisms, actually it could go either way. There are some reasons to think that uh, some conditions under which it might increase aggregate demand, but there's also a lot of reasons to think that it might lower aggregate demand. In particular, if you cut wages, workers will have less money to spend and therefore consumption expenditures will go down. Now, if you cut wages, it will also put a downward pressure uh, on prices. And if you put the downward pressure on prices, if you have an economy, say, with a high debt burden, that means that it makes it harder for those indebted units, whether they are households or firms, to repay their debt. So there's all sorts of reasons why to think uh, that, um, uh, that uh, a wage cut, meaning the market adjustment to involuntary unemployment, will actually have perverse effects uh, uh, on the goods market in the sense that it will not get you closer to a full employment equilibrium but it may well get you further away. But overall the Keynesian view is that the feedback from the labour market on the goods market is very slow anyways uh, and uh, the action on the goods market is faster and uh, the action on the financial markets is even faster than that. So the, the labour market typically uh, gets uh, uh, dragged along. Now one important implication uh, of what I just said is that if you're thinking of the labor market and if you're trying to model the labor market, you can't just assume a downward sloping labor demand curve in the real wage. That downward sloping labor demand curve <coughs> is derived under the assumption uh, of full capacity utilization. It's derived from the situation where firms are not facing demand constraints, where they can sell everything they want. Now in the Keynesian world, the, the situation of unemployment is one where you're in recession. In that recession, firms will have underutilized resources. They will be able to produce more than they are selling, and therefore, there's no reason to a priori to assume that the labor demand curve is downward sloping. Thus, in a Keynesian model of the labor market, you will always have what we call a notional labor demand curve, which is the neoclassically full employment labor demand curve. And there will be an effective labor demand curve that links either nominal wages or real wages uh, uh, to aggregate expenditure and aggregate demand. And there's no reason to think that the aggregate uh, uh, that the effective labor demand is downward sloping. In particular in situations where we have what we call a wage-led demand regime, uh, the uh, labor demand curve uh, will, uh, depending on the productivity effect, also be upward sloping. Now, there's recently been a bit more work on, so what I've said now was more in the realm of of short-run analysis, there's recently also been more work on, on more medium-term or long-term models and there post-Keynesians emphasize the notion of hysteresis and the fact that uh, as uh, bargaining on the labor market is characterized by institutions, uh, those uh, wage bargaining curves will themselves shift over time uh, and the uh, the, what is in mainstream models, the price setting curve uh, as it depends on the capital stock will also react uh, to uh, uh, say changes in animal spirits and thus the labor market equilibrium uh, will also in the long run be dragged along by the goods market uh, via hysteresis mechanisms. A big block and recently very prominent block of post-Keynesian theory uh, is on money and finance. Now in modern post-Keynesian theory uh, we have uh, a theory of uh, endogenous money creation. That's essentially 
uh, that money is created as a side effect of lending decisions. Uh, when uh, the bank lends uh, you some money, it transfers a certain of mon amount of money uh, on your deposits and the way that the central banks uh, calculate the money supply is essentially they look at how much money uh, is on deposits. Because in modern economies, of course, 90% plus of uh, the total money supply, even of the narrow money supply measures, uh, is, is bank menu as account money and not uh, bills and coins. That also means that if you repay a, a loan, uh, the balance sheet of the bank shrinks and thereby money gets destroyed. So the way that uh, credit can create money uh, also means that the repayment of the loan destroys money. If that is the case, if we have an endogenous money supply, that means that our standard money supply would turn horizontal, you need a different theory of the interest rate because it's not the interest rate anymore that uh, uh, can bring the two of them in equilibrium. And what we then typically assume is that um, it's the central bank that sets the base rate and banks, uh, who are usually large institutions that have marking power, uh, set the interest rates on the one hand for deposits uh, and uh, for loans as a markup on that base rate. Um, now the extent to which uh, the private institutions are marking up or down uh, the, the, the base rate of the central bank may itself depend on the liquidity preference of uh, the financial institutions. Thus, in a situation uh, as we had in 2000, uh, 2007, 2008, where banks are very worried about their survival and where they want to hold a lot of money, they may increase uh, their markups on loans or may uh, increase the markdowns uh, on deposits. Sorry, decrease the markdowns on deposits. Uh, one uh, development of the post-Keynesian uh, financial theory, right, uh, only five minutes I see, uh, one development of um, post-Keynesian financial uh, theory have, has been the debt cycles of Hyman Minsky, who emphasizes, uh, who has a dynamic theory uh, of capitalism and locates the source of financial instability, uh, of uh, economic instability uh, in the instability of financial markets. And what is key uh, to how he thinks about financial instability uh, is debt relations. So for him, uh, debt uh, in, in, in his original writings is mostly about the, the debt of firms. And as firms experience uh, a, a, a period of growth, uh, they like to invest. Uh, and because the situation has been such that in the past few years we had high growth rates, uh, they are optimistic in the outlook, thus their animal spirits with respect to investment go up and they can also convince their banks to lend them. So in the course of the boom for Minsky, uh, uh, non-financial institutions are taking on higher and higher levels of debt. There's a pro-cyclical leverage rate. Uh, and that uh, pro-cyclical leverage is what provides the mechanism uh, of the downturn of the cycle. At some point, banks will get worried uh, about the high leverage uh, rate of their customers and uh, those customers, those firms might find themselves uh, squeezed by the interest burden that they have to uh, pay on this debt. Because what Minsky highlights is that the, the firm's struggle for survival is essentially one where they have a certain debt burden from their past investment decisions but what they have to do in the present period is they have to service the debt burden out of their current inflow, out of their cash flow. Uh, and if interest rates are rising or if they have difficulties rolling over uh, their debt, then uh, uh, we enter a crisis. And so the crisis uh, for Minsky breaks out when firms are having difficulties repaying their debt and thus the financial institutions have to write down their debt and then you have Balance, adjust, balance sheets adjustments. Uh, yeah, and that is uh, a, uh, a uh, sort of a general approach that has gotten quite a bit of 
publicity recently after the 2008 7-8 uh, crisis. That is one of the papers that uh, comes out of the Bank of England and the Bank, uh, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, that tries to identify historic um, debt cycles, the red line being uh, uh, the growth rates uh, of debt and the blue line being the, the growth rate of real GDP. Now that said, there's also um, uh, real theories of the business cycle from the post-Keynesian side, the Caldo and Kalecki models of the business cycles. Uh, essentially business cycles where you have on the one hand the demand effect of investment decisions and on the other hand the, the capacity or supply creating effect. Uh, of investment decision and it's uh, that sort of multiply accelerator mechanism uh, that generates the business cycle. Uh, yeah, and I've already mentioned inflation in these models is the money supply is endogenous, is uh, the outcome of unresolved conflicts between capital, labor and potentially finance. Uh, very briefly on the, uh, on the historical development of post-Keynesian economics, at the uh, beginning of post-Keynesian economics and the use, post the, the use of the term post-Keynesian economics, uh, the, the term is only used from the mid or early 70s on. Before that, while you had the post-Keynesians, John Robinson, uh, Kalecki, Caldo and so on, uh, it, they, they weren't writing under the heading uh, of post-Keynesian economics. So at that time, the project was very much of uh, one uh, turning Keynesian short-run analysis into one of a long-run analysis, uh, is a long-run theory of growth and distribution. Uh, and that uh, involved uh, the Cambridge capital controversies, uh, but also the Cambridge growth models. And the, 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 uh, the feature of these models is that you have an, an independent investment function in the long run and thus the savings investment equilibrium uh, is still out there. Uh, at that time, uh, post Keynesian economics was also very much uh, centered uh, a, around Cambridge and the, the group around Keynes who had worked with Keynes initially uh, was driving the process. Uh, mind you, it's also the time when neoclassical economics developed its growth theory, uh, when sort of uh, in the short run uh, with the ISLM model they still incorporate some uh, Keynesian features. Uh, but uh, those very same people, Solov, Samuelson and so on, developed the neoclassical growth theory. And then in the 70s uh, we have a shift within mainstream economics. Uh, so the, the old uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 opposite sides of the Cambridge controversies actually isn't the new mainstream anymore. Um, and post-Keynesians, as other heterodox economists, get marginalized uh, within economics departments. At that point, post-Keynesian economics geographically spreads out, in particular as a much more dynamism in the US in the field of post-Keynesian economics. Uh, and uh, Cambridge, at least the economics department, gets increasingly cleansed from post-Keynesians. <coughs> but there's also a thematic shift, finance issues uh, of money creation become a lot more important because it's the time of monetarism, so that's the theory when endogenous money theory becomes important, but it's also the time when the theory of liquidity preference becomes a lot more prominent than it was, say, in the 1950s. Um, it's also the time when uh, uh, Minsky's financial stability hypothesis, instability hypothesis gets elaborated uh, and uh, when the, the, uh, the, the, the initially small literature building on Minsky uh, gets established. In the 1980s, uh, we have uh, the reformulations of a lot of the Kaletskian uh, models. Kaletsky before that sort of had a middle ground between uh, post-Keynesian and Marxian economics. Uh, sort of in the 80s, Kalecki increasingly becomes a post-Keynesian. It becomes a standard fare for post-Keynesians versus most of the Marxists increasingly forget about Kalecki except for the, for the 43 paper. And in the course of the 90s, uh, we have on the one hand debates on methodology, uh, but on the other hand, we also have a big shift in terms of a lot more work on economic policy issues and a lot more empirical work. We have 
whole new generation of young post-Keynesians, including myself, if I may still consider myself young, uh, who are trained in econometric methods uh, and who uh, want to apply them uh, and think about ways where that can be useful uh, within post-Keynesian economics. So if you look at uh, a post-Keynesian conference today, you will have all sorts of methodological papers, but you will also have a, a block of uh, uh, papers that use uh, uh, economic modeling, but you will also have uh, a group of econometric papers. Um, yeah, I guess that will do by way of wrapping up. So a fairly stylized uh, uh, contrast between neoclassical and Keynesian uh, theory, uh, post-Keynesians reject uh, rational behavior. They think that we need a conventional theory of behavior and that animal spirits, non-rational uh, elements with respect to economic variables do play a, a critical role and thus uh, institutions matter. Markets in general will not clear. We will have a savings investment equilibrium on the goods market. We may have a market clearing but a, a non-rational uh, market clearing equilibrium on financial markets, but we certainly typically don't have uh, market clearing on, on labor markets. Money matters, there's uh, money has to be, uh, money, uh, uh, I should say more broadly, finance has to be an integral part of in economic modeling, whether it's in the form of money or whether it's in the form of debt that plays the key role. Uh, and the, the main policy implication of that is uh, that market economies are intrinsically unstable and will uh, usually come with unemployment and that is the fundamental uh, justification on why uh, we need government intervention. Uh, now I'll skip the more detailed part uh, of, the, of the history uh, and I'll end uh, with a brief commercial break if I may. <laughs> uh, I'm part of uh, the Post-Keynesian Study Group, the Network of Post-Keynesian Economics, which in cooperation with the Political Economy Research Group at Kingston University is organizing an introduction to Post-Keynesian Economics and Political Economy uh, in about two weeks from now, 10 to 12th of July, uh, where next to myself, Malcolm Sawyer and Vicky Chik, who's here, uh, will be presenting, uh, but also Gary Dimsky. Uh, and on the political economy side, Simon Moore and Julian Wells, who's also presenting at that conference, at this conference here, uh, and uh, Andy Higginbottom. Uh, the Post-Keynesian Study Group also has an annual workshop that's typically in June. There's a big uh, Post-Keynesian conference of the research uh, group Macroeconomic and Macroeconomic Policy in Berlin in October every year. Uh, and uh, there's also a summer school of data associations. If you want to uh, want to learn more about post-Keynesian economics, that uh, uh, workshop, the introduction to post-Keynesian economics might be a good way. There's also a post, uh, PKSG also has an email list that you can uh, subscribe to under that uh, web address. But with that, I apologize for going over time.